Hi, welcome to this video in Linear Programming Duality. In this video, we're going to be discussing Farkash Lemma. So Farkash Lemma is the following statement. It says, given the system ax equals b and x greater than or equal to zero, then exactly one of the following two conditions is true. Either one, there exists an x-bar such that ax bar equals b and x bar is greater than or equal to zero. So in other words, we're just saying that there's an x-bar that satisfies these constraints, so the system is feasible. Um, or, if that's not occurring, then condition two occurs, which is uh, saying that there exists a y-bar such that a transpose y-bar is greater than or equal to zero, and b transpose y-bar is strictly negative. So here, x-bar and y-bar are just vectors of the appropriate dimensions such that all the matrix multiplication makes sense. And a useful way to view this statement is to first make the trivial observation that either this system is feasible or it isn't. Of course, one of those two things is true. So if the system is feasible, well, that's exactly what condition one is saying. It's saying that there exists an x-bar such that the constraints are satisfied. So um, condition one is going to be true if and only if the system is feasible. But remember, we're saying that exactly one of the following two conditions is true. So if condition one is true, if and only if the system is feasible, then condition two is going to be true, if and only if the system is not feasible. And condition two is saying that there exists a vector y bar such that some particular conditions are satisfied. Um, but basically, what you're supposed to do is view y bar as a certificate that uh, certifies uh, that the system is infeasible. Because such a vector y bar is going to exist if and only if this system is infeasible. So we can elaborate just a bit more on what this is saying at the end of the video, but actually it turns out that the proof of this statement is quite simple once you've assumed strong duality, and if you're following this series of videos, then at this point we have assumed strong duality. We've, we've assumed slash proven it. So um, now that we know strong duality, we can easily prove uh, Farkash Lemma. So let's take a look at how the proof for Farkash Lemma should go. So let's take a look at how we can prove Farkash Lemma. So, what we have at the start is this system of constraints, and what we would like to do is prove that exactly one of these two conditions that's related to this system of constraints uh, applies to it. Um, so at first glance, it seems uh, pretty natural where condition one is coming from. It's just talking about feasibility or lack thereof of this system. Um, but condition two is just slightly more arbitrary. Um, I mean, all the data is still related to the system, but it's not quite as clear why we're talking about A transpose times a vector and B transpose uh, times a vector uh, being negative, for instance. Where are these things coming from? Uh, in fact, both of these conditions are actually just talking about properties of a primal dual pair of linear programs in disguise. So in the background right now, there's a primal dual pair of linear programs, and conditions one and two are just discussing properties of this primal dual pair. So we're going to use duality theory, and that will uh, reveal that these two conditions are in fact uh, the right conclusions that we can draw. So first of all, um, we're going to write down this primal dual pair of linear programs, and uh, then things will start to become pretty clear. So what is the primal dual pair? Well, first of all, um, we'll be maximizing zero transpose x uh, such that ax equals b and x greater than or equal to zero. Uh, so this will be the primal. And I'll discuss uh, this linear program in just a moment, um, but let me write down the dual uh, first off. So the dual will be uh, min b transpose y such that a transpose y is greater than or equal to zero and uh, y is actually free. So that's the dual linear program. So uh, related to the primal, the thing that might strike you as odd is that we have a zero transpose x here, and if you note uh, zero transpose x is of course just the number zero. So, um, so why are we even writing that down? That just seems a bit vacuous and artificial. Um, but in fact, the reason that this zero appears is because um, this zero vector in the objective function of the primal is going to be the same zero that appears in the um, constraints of the dual um, matrix constraints, and as the right-hand side components. Um, so it's really because we want a zero here. Now, why would we want a zero here? Because if you notice, uh, these constraints in the dual linear program, this is saying a transpose y is greater than or equal to zero. And that's exactly part of what condition two is talking about. It's talking about a vector y that satisfies a transpose y being greater than or equal to zero, in part. Of course, there's another part as well, but uh, at least at first we need a vector y 
that um, uh, satisfies this dual linear program with uh, feasibility. Um, but of course, there's one more thing in condition two. Condition two is also saying that uh, B transpose Y was negative. And B transpose Y, that's exactly what the um, dual objective function is. So really, everything that we're saying here is we're just talking about the dual linear program. And uh, condition one is talking about the primal linear program, because the primal has the constraints um, of uh, AX equals B and X greater than or equal to zero. So let's reinterpret what these two conditions are saying in light of what duality theory says about this primal dual pair of linear programs. So first of all, um, if condition one holds, then that means that the primal linear program is feasible because uh, there's something that satisfies these constraints. There's such an X bar. However, it cannot also be the case that condition two also holds. Um, so let's say they both held at the same time. So there was something that was feasible uh, for the primal and, uh, and then there was also something that was feasible for the dual that had this additional property that the objective function was negative. Um, well, so if we have such an X bar and a Y bar, um, the reason that this goes wrong is because by weak duality, we know that the objective function of the dual is at least as large as the objective function of the primal. And, uh, and so what we can say is that B transpose Y bar is going to be greater than or equal to zero transpose X bar. But of course, it doesn't really matter what X bar is. This just evaluates to zero, the number zero. So no matter what, it has to be the case that B transpose Y bar is non-negative. Um, but condition two is saying that we have um, a Y bar such that it, it's feasible for the dual, uh, but also B transpose Y bar is strictly negative. But of course, we're, as we've just demonstrated by weak duality, uh, that's impossible. So weak duality tells us that, the, that these two conditions can't hold simultaneously. So if it was the case that one held true, then it must be the case, so let's say one true, um, it must be the case that two is false, um, because they can't both be true at the same time. On the other hand, what would happen if instead one was false? What we would like to conclude is that two must necessarily be true. In other words, there does exist uh, such a vector y that satisfies these conditions. Now, how can we draw that conclusion? Uh, well, what you can notice is that, so what, one being false, um, this would imply that, um, uh, maybe, maybe I, I can write this down below, um, one false, uh, this implies that um, the primal is infeasible. And so then by strong duality, uh, that tells us that the dual, uh, so let me make that look more like a P there, uh, the dual is going to be um, either uh, infeasible or unbounded. But it cannot have an optimal solution because that goes against what strong duality tells us. So strong duality, in part, says that one linear program has an optimal solution if and only if its dual also has an optimal solution. But we're saying that the primal here does not have an optimal solution, so then neither can the dual. So the dual is either infeasible or unbounded. Um, but in fact, the dual is not infeasible. Um, so we can scratch out infeasible because um, y bar, uh, so let's just say here, uh, y bar being the all zero vector um, is feasible. Uh, and so you can just easily verify that. A transpose times zero is, of course, greater than or equal to zero. And there's no other constraints. So this tells us that the dual then must actually be unbounded. And if the dual is unbounded and we're minimizing, then of course, B transpose Y uh, goes um, all the way to minus infinity. So, um, so this, I'll just say, um, can go to minus infinity. Uh, in particular, it can, it can be negative. So we're not saying that uh, Y bar equaling zero, that's the thing that satisfies condition two. That's not the right vector. But we know there's some other vector Y bar that uh, will satisfy both of these conditions, because it must, because our linear program uh, is unbounded. So that tells us then that, um, that uh, in other words, uh, two is, uh, is true. Okay, and so I'll just write that up top. So one false implies two uh, true. And so, uh, in other words, these two things uh, combined uh, tell us that um, uh, this implies that exactly one of uh, one and two is true. 
Okay, so when you're taking a look at the conditions specified in uh, Farkash Lemma, one condition is secretly talking about the feasibility of a particular l primal linear program, uh, given here, and the second condition is secretly talking about the uh, feasibility and unboundedness of a dual linear program. So this primal and dual were secretly operating in the background the whole time, and uh, we just applied duality theory to them to draw these conclusions. So when you read these conclusions, in the back of your mind you're thinking about this primal dual pair of linear programs associated to these conditions. So that's the proof of Farkash Lemma. So just as a final point to elaborate on that initial intuition we were making on Farkash Lemma, um, in general, when we have a linear program that's of standard equality form of this type here, then of course we know that the linear program is either feasible or infeasible. And it's easy to prove that a linear program is feasible because all you have to do is find a single feasible solution. But at face value, it should probably be a lot harder to prove that your linear program is infeasible because naively it seems like you would have to check infinitely many vectors x and show that all of them don't satisfy the constraints. But instead of that, uh, there's actually this statement called Farkash Lemma, which we've just proven, and it says that um, either the linear program is feasible or there is a vector y uh, which certifies that the linear program is infeasible. So that vector y bar that we've been talking about, um, that's acting as a certificate that your linear program is not feasible. Um, if it exists, you can't possibly have a feasible solution for this primal linear program. And it's important to point out that it's not just some infeasible linear programs that have something that certifies that they're infeasible, it's every infeasible linear program has a certificate of infeasibility. You can always find such a vector y. So there's certainly more things that we could say about Farkash Lemma. Uh, for instance, uh, none of what we've discussed has described how we can actually find such a vector y bar that acts as a certificate of infeasibility. All we've said is that it is necessarily going to exist, but uh, constructing one, algorithmically finding one, um, has not been addressed at all. But in fact, there are algorithmically ways of determining how to find such a certificate. Additionally, if you note, what we did was we proved Farkash Lemma via strong duality. We needed strong duality uh, to prove it, but in fact, uh, it turns out that Farkash Lemma is equivalent to strong duality. And actually, in general, um, there's many, many statements that are all equivalent to Farkash Lemma, and actually many of them are just called Farkash Lemma, and so you might see Farkash Lemma um, in a different context, and it doesn't look like the statement that we've made here, but that's because it's equivalent to it, and there's many, many equivalences, so um, strong duality is just one of them. So another topic we might address would be how we can use Farkash Lemma to prove strong duality. And in general, many of the equivalences uh, that are co sometimes called Farkash Lemma uh, also look a lot like the Farkash Lemma that we just described. They're typically going to be of some format that either one thing happens or there's a piece of data which certifies that this thing cannot happen. And that's the general format. But anyways, those are all topics that could be addressed in future videos uh, related to Farkash Lemma. But those things can all wait for another time. Um, that will certainly suffice for this video, um, so we'll just leave it at to be continued for now. For now, thank you for watching.